This is a short video on antiarrhythmic drugs, or a class of drugs that suppress abnormal cardiac rhythms. Now on this first page here, we have a picture of an abnormal cardiac rhythm, in this case, atrial fibrillation. This second EKG that you see here, the bottom EKG, shows atrial fibrillation, and we know it's atrial fibrillation because we see random activity going on in between the QRX complexes, and the QRS complexes are irregularly spaced apart. They don't happen at a regular interval. So if we administer an antiarrhythmic drug to a person with atrial fibrillation, as shown in that bottom EKG, we have the potential to bring them back to normal sinus rhythm. So this is just one example of fixing a arrhythmia problem with an antiarrhythmic drug. And we're going to talk about the different classes of antiarrhythmic drugs here. We're going to start with class 1A antiarrhythmic agents. These drugs provide a moderate block of sodium channels, which increases the action potential duration. Now these words are bolded because it'll help us differentiate the A1 class from A, excuse me, it'll help us differentiate the 1A class from the 1B and 1C class. So we're blocking sodium channels, and a couple examples of these class 1A drugs are quinidine. Quinidine has a side effect of blocking the Herg channel, which results in a long QT syndrome. And if you have long QT, that always puts you at risk for torsades de poids. Torsades is shown in that EKG shown there. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a twisting of the spikes. It's when the EKG lead goes up and down above the neutral axis very rapidly. It's very dangerous. It could progress to ventricular fibrillation and cause cardiac or sudden cardiac death. Another class 1A antiarrhythmic agent is procainamide, which is a little better uh, than quinidine because it, it, it does less prolongation of the QT segment. And one last example of a 1A drug is disoperamide, which decreases the force of contraction in the heart. Next class uh, we're going to talk about are the 1B and 1C antiarrhythmic agents. Under the 1B, we know that they provide a mild block of sodium channels, which decreases the action potential. And I have a table on the next slide that'll help us organize this, but uh, 1B has a mild block and that decreases action potential duration. Two examples here are lidocaine, which can only be administered intravenously, and mexiltine, which can be administered orally and uh, helps you administer those two drugs differently based on what you need. These provide a mild block, which decreases action potential duration. Class 1C agents provide a marked block of sodium channels, and this actually doesn't change the action potential duration. The two Class 1C drugs are flecken or flecainide, which produces an increase in ventricular arrhythmias, so it's not, not quite the best antiarrhythmic agent. Propafenone is a little better. It does have some beta blocker effects, typical beta blocker effects such as bradycardia and decreasing cardiac ionotropy. Now this will help us organize the three class one agents in that table below. 1A has a moderate sodium block, which increases action potential duration as shown in that top graph at the top right. We have a moderate block in sodium, which increases action potential duration. 1B is that middle graph, which has a mild sodium block, which decreases action potential duration. Class 1C has a marked sodium block, which has no change in action potential duration. Now remember that the upswing of that action potential shown in the top right is due to sodium coming into the cell. So that's why we see a difference in slope during that upswing in those graphs shown at the top right. In general, class one agents change action potential by changing sodium influx, as we said. They also decrease phase four depolarization and they increase the threshold potential. So they make it easier to reach threshold to, uh, to depolarize the cells. Let's move on to class two antiarrhythmic agents. Class two antiarrhythmic agents are essentially beta blockers. They block beta adrenergic receptors. They therefore block the effects of catecholamines like epi, norepi, and dopamine. They reduce the myocardial need for oxygen, which can decrease the degree of ischemia. They slow heart rates. They slow the, the contractility. 
They also decrease the slope of the phase four depolarization, which can decrease the automaticity of the heart and potentially solve some arrhythmias. One last effect of the class two antiarrhythmic drugs are that they prolong repolarization in the AV node, which could block some reentry pathways going around the AV node and potentially, uh, potentially fix the AVNRT arrhythmia. Now class three antiarrhythmic agents. These all collectively block potassium channels, specifically the DRK, delayed rectifier potassium channel. Now remember that the downswing of the myocyte action potential, which is marked as three on that graph, phase three repolarization, is caused by potassium leaving the cells. So if you're gonna block that channel, you're gonna have a less steep slope during phase three repolarization. So again, we emphasize that it's going to prolong phase three repolarization. And uh, a couple of drugs are listed here. The big one is amiodarone. And we're going to go into amiodarone a bit more. Amiodarone is uh, widely known for having various effects through many mechanisms. It, listing them here decreases node firing, decreases automaticity, decreases reentrant effects. It blocks all kinds of channels, like, uh, like many of the classes that, that we talked about that we're going to talk about also acts kind of like the beta blockers as well. There are many tachyarrhythmias that can be treated with amiodarone, but it also has unique pharmacokinetic properties and a bunch of side effects. It lasts for about 25 to 60 days, and you cannot easily diminish or reverse the effects. So this might make physicians a little hesitant to use amiodarone if you cannot diminish or reverse the effects. Now, some of the side effects, primarily pulmonary, can cause pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis. You can have cardiac effects, such as bradycardia, because, of course, you're decreasing sinus node firing, you're decreasing automaticity, you're decreasing reentry circuits. You can cause long QT segment, which, as we said earlier, leads to torsades de poids. It can cause thyroid problems because there's a big iodine molecule or a big iodine atom in the middle of the molecule. It can cause GI distress and central nervous system distress. So amiodarone, just talked about it, has a bunch of effects, can be used to treat a bunch of drugs. This is all rehashing what we had on the previous slide, has a bunch of side effects. There are a couple analogs to amiodarone, those two listed here, that do not have the thyroid effects, that do not cause thyroid problems. And finally, we have a sodalol, which is a beta blocker that has similar effects to the class three agents. It blocks potassium channels. Now let's jump into the class four agents of antiarrhythmic drugs. These specifically block calcium channels, specifically the L-type calcium channels. These are most effective on the nodes, the SA and the AV nodes, because these nodes depend on calcium channels for their depolarization, for their pacemaking ability. The effects of these agents are that they decrease heart rate by specifically affecting the SA and AV nodes. They decrease transmission through the AV node, again, because they are most effective on the nodes. They terminate reentrant rhythms, such as the AVNRT tachycardia. They also treat AV nodal, well, that's, what, that's what we just said, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, and that's what they're primarily used for. They do have some side effects, can cause hypotension, and heart failure in people who are also taking beta blockers. So if you start compounding the effects of these drugs, uh, it could be too low of a heart rate or too low of a blood pressure. Two drugs that are worth knowing are diltiazem and verapamil. And finally, we have two more antiarrhythmic drugs that are worth mentioning. Let's start with digoxin. Digoxin specifically blocks the sodium potassium pump. It can be used to treat heart failures complicated with atrial fibrillation, and all the effects of digoxin are kind of along the same lines. They 
increase parasympathetic activation of of the of the heart. So we're going to see a decrease in heart rate. We're going to see an increase in vagal tone. We're going to see a reduction in sympathetic activity. So all of those kind of mean the same thing. Decrease heart rate. Uh, in the case of digoxin, it's by blocking the sodium potassium pump. Last drug that's worth talking about is adenosine. Now adenosine is a rapid opener of the potassium channel. It activates that potassium channel. Adenosine is unique because it has a very, very short half-life. So when you inject it into the into the veins, it needs to be followed with a bolus of saline. So you put adenosine into the vasculature, you flush it with saline to push it into the heart where it has its main effect, its main antiarrhythmic effect. And it, you want to do this very quickly because it does seem lasts very, very uh, short periods of time in the body before being degraded. Adenosine is a strong hyperpolarizer of cells. And that makes sense because it's opening all of those potassium channels. It decreases depolarization in the SA node and decreases conduction through the AV node. So it can fix those AV node reentrant tachycardias, and it can also slow a, a tachycardia that's originating in the SA node. Adenosine allows for rapid termination, as, as I just said, of reentrant supraventricular tachycardias. And it's I kind of like to think of it as a chemical defibrillator. It kind of neutralizes all the cells in the nodes, lets them start again, hyperpolarizes everything super quick, lasts a very short amount of time. It's kind of like a shock, but it's a chemical, obviously. And it needs to be injected and followed by a saline flush because it's so fast acting and it's lasts a very short amount of time. So these are all the classes of antiarrhythmic drugs. I hope this PowerPoint was helpful and thank you for listening.